first off, uh, oh, okay, so thank you. I'll set that. And I'll get the screen share going. So uh, Debbie, when you're ready, if you'll begin with the opening prayers, it'll be great. Thank you. Will do, and if everybody could mute. All mother sentient beings, especially those enemies who hate me, obstructors who harm me, and those who create obstacles on my path to liberation and omniscience, may they experience happiness, be separated from suffering, and swiftly I will establish them in this state of unsurpassed, perfect, complete, and precious Buddhahood. All mother sentient beings, especially those enemies who hate me, obstructors who harm me, and those who create obstacles on my path to liberation and omniscience. May they experience happiness, be separated from suffering, and swiftly I will establish them in the state of unsurpassed, perfect, complete, and precious Buddhahood. All mother sentient beings, especially those enemies who hate me, obstructors who harm me, and those who create obstacles on my path to liberation and omniscience. May they experience happiness, be separated from suffering, and swiftly I will establish them in the state of unsurpassed, perfect, complete, and precious Buddhahood. Thus, until I achieve enlightenment, I perform virtuous deeds with body, speech, and mind. Until death, I perform virtuous deeds with body, speech, and mind. From now until this time tomorrow, I perform virtuous deeds with body, speech, and mind. Thus, until I achieve enlightenment, I perform virtuous deeds with body, speech, and mind. Until death, I perform virtuous deeds with body, speech, and mind. From now until this time tomorrow, I perform virtuous deeds with body, speech, and mind. Thus, until I achieve enlightenment, I perform virtuous deeds with body, speech, and mind. Until death, I perform virtuous deeds with body, speech, and mind. From now until this time tomorrow, I perform virtuous deeds with body, speech, and mind. In the Buddha, the Dharma, and Sangha most excellent, I take refuge until enlightenment is reached. By the merit of generosity and other good deeds, may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. In the Buddha, the Dharma, and Sangha most excellent, I take refuge until enlightenment is reached. By the merit of generosity and other good deeds, may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. In the Buddha, the Dharma, and Sangha most excellent, I take refuge until enlightenment is reached. By the merit of generosity and other good deeds, may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. May all mother sentient beings, boundless as the sky, have happiness and the causes of happiness. May they be liberated from suffering and the causes of suffering. May they never be separated from the happiness that is free from sorrow. May they rest in equanimity, free from attachment and aversion. May all mother sentient beings, boundless as the sky, have happiness and the causes of happiness. May they be liberated from suffering and the causes of suffering. May they never be separated from the happiness that is free from sorrow. May they rest in equanimity, free from attachment and aversion. May all mother sentient beings, boundless as the sky, have happiness and the causes of happiness. May they be liberated from suffering and the causes of suffering. May they never be separated from the happiness that is free from sorrow. And may they rest in equanimity, free from attachment and aversion. Let's sit for a few minutes. Relax, release, bring your mind home to focus clear awareness on the here and now.
and gradually turn your mind within. and rest in the nature of your mind. Without any contrivance or manipulation. Take a deep breath and hold it. Exhale completely, squeeze your abdomen, squeeze all that stale negative dark air out. Hold that empty breath. And relax and breathe normal and open your eyes. Thank you all very much for coming tonight. We're almost near the end. So tonight uh, we're talking about the Ishvari. The Ishvari are the yoginis of the courtyard. So we'll be explaining a little bit more about them. But first we should do our uh, purification practice on page uh, 14, 15, and 16. So uh, can I ask Michael, would you uh, recite uh, the purification for us? And we can all follow along with Michael as he recites this. So please don't forget to read the English translation in that little English box and then recite the mantra three times and the beginning part and then the mantra, the hundred syllable mantra three times. When you're ready, Michael, please begin. <clears throat> the natural liberation of habitual tendencies, purification, 
in the unified intention of the body, speech, and mind of the 42 peaceful and 30 and 58 wrathful deities of the great Buddha field that displays the wisdom that cuts through all ignorance to manifest their wisdom for the benefit of the enlightenment of all sentient beings. <clears throat> Om Ahom Bodhicitta Mahasukha Jana Datu Ahom Rulu Rulu Om Byom Om Om Ahom Bodhicitta Mahasukha Jana Datu Ahom Rulu Rulu Om Byom Om Om Ahom Bodhicitta Mahasukha Jana Datu Ahom Rulu Rulu Om Byom Om Om from the field of, of reality's expanse, uncreated and pure, within a celestial palace, which is a seminal point of light, pure, unceasing, and radiant, through the natural expressive power of one's mind, uncontrived and empty, intrinsic awareness, radiant and empty, arises in the form of Vajrasattva, <clears throat> seated upon a bejeweled, <clears throat> excuse me, seated upon a bejeweled throne adorned with lotus sun and moon cushions. The right hand holds the Vajra at the heart, symbolizing the union of awareness of absolute wisdom and emptiness. The left hand supports a bell resting on the hip, symbolizing the union of wisdom appearances and emptiness. And the head is adorned with a garland of perfect Buddhas representing the five enlightened families of those gone to bliss. Thus, Vajrasattva manifests in the form of the Buddha body of per perfect resource, exquisitely adorned with silks and jewels, seated in the posture of royal ease with the right leg extended and the left drawn in. Radiating at the heart is the seat syllable home, surrounded by the hundred syllable mantra. Om Vajrasattva Samaya Manupalaya Vajrasattva Tenopa Krishta Tvido Me Bhava Sutto Kayo Me Bhava Supo Kayo Me Bhava Anuraktu Me Bhava Sarva Siri Me Prayatsa Sarva Kama Sutsa Me Sitsan Shriya Kuru Hon Ha 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 Ho Bhagavan Sarva Tata Gata Bajra Mame Munsa Bajri Baba Mahasamaya Sattva <clears throat> Om Bajra Sattva Samaya Manupalaya Bajra Sattva Tenopa Trista Drido Me Baba Sutto Kayo Me Baba Supo Kayo Me Baba Anuraktu Me Baba Sarva Siri Me Prayacha Sarva karma sutsa me sitsan shriya kuru hong ha 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 ho bhagavan sarva tata gata basre mame munsa basre bhava mahasamaya sattva ha om basra sattva samaya anupalaya basra sattva tenopa kishta drido me bhava Sutto kayo me bhava, supo kayo me bhava, anuraktu me bhava, sarva siri me prayatsa, sarva karma sutsa me, sitsan shriya kuru hong, ha 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 ho, bhagavan, sarva tata gata, asra mame munsa, basri bhava mahasamaya, sattva ha. Very good, thank you. So tonight we're talking about the Ishvari. And uh, last week we talked about the projectoresses. And anybody who missed that talk, and uh, it's available on YouTube. So if you would uh, like to get the link for that, if you don't have the link, uh, you can let me know and I can send you the link. But it was a very interesting uh, and, and different um, uh, uh, session in uh, talking about the, uh, the projectoresses. So, uh, and the idea of the projectoresses and the Ishvari 
is that we are in the courtyard of the mandala, the mandala of the deities, of the, of the um, 42 peaceful deities and the 58 wrathful deities. So as I use this uh, example of, a, of the stupa, excuse me one second. So here is the, the stupa and, uh, and on the stupa are the, the different deities and so on that we've been talking about. And around the courtyard, around here, the lower level of the stupa is where the, the Ishvari uh, and the projectoresses would be in the courtyard. And they are the yoginis. The yogini, so it implies the yogini means that they are ordinary beings like us. However, they are on the path uh, to enlightenment. They are in the courtyard. They are on the path. They are approaching the mandala. So whether we're coming from the top down and encountering the Asvari on the top down on our way into being reborn, or we're encountering from the way up that we are now born and we are working our way to become familiar with the uh, mandala deities that we are encountering these yoginis who are helping us to focus, so helping us to uh, recognize uh, certain characteristics, certain parts of the Dharma, certain parts of ourself uh, to be able to, uh, to save ourselves from being reborn in, in lower realms, to have a good noble rebirth in the case when we're coming from the top down or from the bottom up that we are uh, <clears throat> we're focusing on what it is that we're trying to accomplish, what our accomplishments will be. So in either case, they're very, very important. And that we're meeting uh, the yoginis all the time. That we're meeting people who don't even realize that what they are expressing are noble thoughts, are generous thoughts, are, are dharma thoughts and so on. But we being um, in tune with the recognition of what it is that is being transmitted, what it is that's being conveyed. So it goes to the point that we are all spiritual beings, whether we recognize it or not. That human beings can't help but, but do that. Now, most of us are, are locked into being our physical bodies, locked into our intellectual body, and they don't recognize what's happening with the spiritual body. But yet, they still are saying things, they still are doing things that are symbolic that are reflective of that spirituality. So we being spiritually awakened beings, we are able to recognize that and, and it's important for us to do that. As we move along and we, we begin doing deity yoga practices, um, whether it's Buddha Amitabha or it's, it's Shen Rezeg or it's Manjushri or it's Vajra Sattva, any of the deity yoga deities, there's always the visualization that we are visualizing that we are doing this for the benefit of others, that all the dedication is for others. So we are seeing not only ourselves as the deity, but we're seeing others as the deity. They may not realize it, but we do. And that's very important. And then through our heart, we are, we are trying to strengthen that vibration in their lives, to harmonize with that vibration in their lives. So they may not even realize what's happening, but maybe uh, there is some kind of a connection there that uh, are like seeds that are being planted and so on. So these Asfari deities are representative of the ordinary beings who are part of this uh, realization or this part of this, this um, becoming uh, these spiritual beings. So if we can turn to page 57 in the, uh, in the book, let's see. Can I ask a question, Lance? Sure. Um, the distinction between worldly Dakinis and I guess enlightened Dakinis. Yes. Are those the two categories? No, these are yoginis. Oh, they're yoginis. Um, so, uh, okay. Okay. 
I don't need, my question was going to be, are they enlightened Dakinis or worldly Dakinis? But they're not. They're just yoginis. They're yoginis. And yoginis is a very noble thing. You know, so, uh, you know, men would be the yogis and the female would be the yoginis. There is a distinction is being made there. And uh, so, you know, and we, we talked about that before, that it seems that the, the feminine aspect of this, you know, birthing this, this, this knowledge, birthing this, this spirituality is very important to be able to understand that, to be able to abide within that. So, yeah, so these are yoginis. Since they're not humans, why isn't why were they could they be called uh dakinis? No, they are human. Oh. Okay. They are human. These are these are human. These are in the courtyard of the mandala, the courtyard of the of the stupa. You know? Okay. So if if Michael, if you don't mind for just a moment, put up your uh your screensaver there. And you can see the mandala of the five of the, there. But, uh, you can see it on your picture there. And if I uh, spotlight it, let me see if I can do that. Um, well, I don't know why. Well, let me pin it for everybody. But maybe you can see that uh, if you can pin it yourself. This is the uh, the mandala of the five Buddha families. So around the periphery, you see the square quadrants of the, of the stupa, of the mandala, and then the green field that is around that, that's within the circle, within the sphere there, that would be the, um, uh -oh, what happened there? Who's doing that? Okay. So within that field of that, uh, within that circular field, that green would be representative of the courtyard. Just to point this out, that the mandala here is a two-dimensional uh, image of uh, of what would be the stupa. So let me go back here. Okay, so we're going back to here. Okay, does everybody have a, a, a visualization of this, an understanding of this, at least to begin the conversation? Okay. So we begin on page 57. Om Ah Hom, and our body, speech, and mind. Om Ah Hom, may my body, speech, and mind become inseparable with the body, speech, and mind of all the enlightened ones. So Om Ah Hom. In the minor channels of the eastern outer courtyard of one skull stand the six queens of yoga who enact the rites of pacification. So here it mentions their names, yak-headed Manarakasi, brownish white and holding a Vajra, snake-headed Brahmani, yellowish white and holding a lotus, leopard-headed Raldri, greenish white and holding a trident, weasel-headed Vajnavi, bluish white and holding a wheel, brown bear headed Komari, reddish white and holding a short pike, and black bear headed Indrani, white and holding a noose of entrails. O you, the six yogini from the east, who enact the rites of pacification, perform the rites which pacify our fears of the intermediate state. So here what we're saying is that these as far as these yogini, that are in this courtyard are there to help us with this pacification, this enlightened activity of enlight of uh, pacification. So there's four enlightened activities, right? There's pacification, there's enrichment, there's subjugation, and then there's the wrathful or the or the um, the uh, challenging, the transformation. So these are the four enlightened activities. And here they are like introducing it to us or reminding us of it, that we have studied this, that we've experienced this, and now they're there to help us to, to really seize on the importance of this. So these Dakini here, 
of these yogini here um, are the pacification rites to pacify our fears of the intermediate state. We're so so if we're coming down, you know, we're we're coming down and we're coming into being human beings. We're being reborn again, so that we're coming into this intermediate state of birth of, of living. So that we're we're taking these seeds with us, these karmic seeds with us. If we're coming up from the bottom up, we're we're remembering. Oh yes, I've learned about that. I practiced that, and I'm using that to approach the mandala so that I can familiarize myself here in the bardo of living with uh, with pacification with these enlightened activities to pacify our fears. So this is one of the 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 um, very important things that we have to deal with is the fears. And the fears can come from our delusions, the fears can come from uh, our desires, the fears can come from uh, our aggression, our hatred. So the fears come from the emotions. And some people would argue that fear is an emotion and so on. And, you know, I'm not going to, you know, argue that. But here it's collectively that these things manifest as fears to us as ordinary human beings. So we, we need to be able to recognize that and deal with that. <clears throat> so these are the Eastern outer courtyard. So then we go to page 58. And now we say, Om Ah Hum. In the minor channels of the Southern outer courtyard of one skull stand the Queens of Yoga who enact the rites of enrichment. So this is the second of the uh, four enlightened activities. And here we find bat-headed Vajra Pingala, yellow and holding a razor. Crocodile-headed Santi, reddish yellow and holding a vase. Scorpion-headed Amrita, reddish yellow and holding a lotus. Hawk-headed Salmi, whitish yellow and holding a Vajra. Hawk-headed, uh, excuse me, uh, fox-headed Dandy, uh, greenish yellow and holding a cudgel, and tiger headed Raksasi, blackish yellow and drinking from a blood filled skull. O oh, you, the six yogini from the south, who enact the rites of enrichment, perform the rites which enrich pristine cognition during the intermediate states. So, uh, so the rites, so the, the practices, the different ritual things that we might do and so on, the readings that we do, you know, to enrich us, to be able to uh, enrich the pristine cognition. So the pristine cognition is the clear light, is the, the, the realization, is the rigpa, is the understanding, the stabilization of the mindfulness of the meditation mind. So this is what this represents. So that's the main point. Those are the main points. The, the secondary or the tertiary, you know, symbology of this would be their colors and would be their names and would be the implements that they're holding. You know, we don't have to fixate on those at this point. There's no, there's no reason to have to do that right now, except to say that they are the implements that are helping the, the process. So you can investigate what that means. You can read into that. You can meditate on that and so on and be able to see you know, how these implements would be helping these yoginis to, to, uh, to help us to, to recognize these, um, these, in, in, uh, these increasing, um, um, these, um, in, um, excuse me, these enlightened activities. Anybody have any questions, just speak right up. So you can see on the left and right of each of these pages, the page on 57 and the page of 58, are the, uh, are the images of these uh, Ishvari. And they're shown to be, you know, wrathful looking with, with different animal heads and, and human bodies and so on to show their, their wrathful character. And this wrathful character, again, you know, is to uh, be able to demonstrate their great compassion, not their anger, but their great compassion to be able to, to meet whatever negativities that are still coming down as we are being born into the human realm or as we're coming from the human realm and approaching the, the, the mandala, 
it, to be able to subdue those, uh, those negativities, those confusions, those uh, emotions. So then we well, go to pay. Yes. Um, I, I have a question. Um, and excuse me if it's uh, sort of petty, petty, but <clears throat> I'm uh, the, uh, the the colors of yes. the uh, <clears throat> of the yogini. <clears throat> um, it's 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 sort of suggestive to me that um, uh, each of these um, courtyards that the yoginis have at least some of the color of the of the um, Buddha family that are responsible for that sort of part of the sundial, as it were, um, yellow and then red. <clears throat> um, the tinges on the colors, um, <clears throat> like the whitish and greenish and blackish. Oh no, the, like the whitish and the paleness and uh, do, do, do those do those signify they seem to they seem to suggest um, elements uh, um, so does that sort of suggest that the the yoginis are um, the, the yogis and the yoginis are part of the um, are some part of the Buddha families but have colors that um, correspond to elements in order to signify their their the human nature that's bonded with the buddha nature their humanity yeah i think so and i think that i think you're absolutely right uh, and like i said but these are secondary and tertiary level you know investigations but as we are meditating on these deities as we're contemplating these deities and then to be able to see how they interact with the other quadrants with the other parts of the of the of the um, of the stupa of the mandala then we can see how this is all interconnected with each other and we begin to understand you know the language of the light in other words the white light the blue light the yellow light the red light and the green light and be able to to do that and as we're doing that you see we're strengthening our meditative mindfulness because when we get beyond our ordinary english language our human language and so on then it, it shifts into the realm of light and light and sound so yes so we begin to make associations between you know these these um these yogini as well as the the other spiritual uh, meditational deities here with those color representations. So we're getting more and more familiar with those things. So yes. Thank you. Could I add one thing to that, Michael, which is in uh, Luminous Emptiness, she points out that in the hundredfold homage, they have the same shadings of colors in the front, but the back side of their bodies for each of the, the groupings by direction would be all the same white or all the same yellow or all the same red or all the same green. So getting back to what you were saying about the, the families. So I just thought that was an interesting distinction. Makes me want to go back and look at the hundredfold homage because I hadn't noticed that. Yeah, and I'd like to comment that, you know, these are visions that these practitioners have had. And who then go ahead and and document these, and they become integral in their practices and so on. So their visions, their appearances, and as such, you know, they're prone to interpretation. The point is, we can have our own visions of these, but we don't have these visions accidentally. We have to cultivate our, our stabilization with this. And the, the visions kind of come of their own. You know, they arise as their own. And they may shift because as, as we become more and more subtle, our point of view becomes more and more subtle. And we begin to see things that were not there. We're not seeing with our eyes. 
we're seeing with our heart mind. And we begin to see and recognize things that we didn't recognize at this level. But now that we're at this level, we begin to see and recognize things up here that we're not seeing down at this level and so on. But it is, it is the guidance through these great teachers, these, these people who have written these great books and everything, or should inspire us to have our own experiences with these things. That's the point. Does that make sense? I mean, does anybody want to discuss that? <clears throat> it does. You can do like an active imagination with the, the deity and, and you know, ask it to speak to you and tell it what it represents and see what comes out of you in reply. Sure. So you take this into your meditation. You contemplate, mm -hmm. you take it into the meditation. You say, well, let me meditate on that. Mm -hmm. And if you're meditating really well, then it becomes clear. The pristine cognition comes, you see. And these all become just points of uh, being able to conceptualize that which, you know, uh, which in its essence cannot be conceptualized, but yet we're trying to do that for our own sake and then for the sake of others as we help other beings. So it's glimpse after glimpse, which becomes vision after vision, which stabilizes as our point of view. We become, we, we begin to see as a spiritual being, we become stable as being a spiritual being, not just an ordinary human being, but a spiritual being, our, our spirituality becomes stable. And people can begin to recognize, oh, yes, that person, yes, I've talked with them. My goodness, they're, they're so spiritual. You know, the vocabulary they use, the, just the aura that they have, you know, the, the, the magnetism that is around them and so on speaks of that spirituality. Not that we should do it for, for that sake, but it just comes of it, the accord of, 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 of being stable in that, in that state of mind, state of the big mind. Okay, so I'll move on. So now this is moving. We started off in the east. So the east is is uh, using the um, uh, Michael. If you can put up your your mandala again, please. So if you see the east is the the, the quadrant, the blue section that is closest to us as we are standing in front of the mandala. Remember, it's a three dimensional mandala. So the blue is in the east, the yellow is in the south, the red is in the west, and the green is in the north, and then the white is in the center. So all four are all connected, all four of the quadrants are connected to the white, and all four are interconnected with each other through each other. Okay, Michael, thank you. So now we go to page 59. Om Ah Hom. In the minor channels of the western branch, or in the western outer courtyard of one skull, stand the six queens of yoga who enact the rites of subjugation. Vulture headed Bakasi, greenish red and holding a club. Horse headed Rati, red and holding a human torso. Garuda heading Rudamadi. Pale red and holding a cudgel, dog-eared, a oh, dog-headed Akarini Raksasi, red and holding a Vajra, hoopoe-headed Manokarika, red and firing an arrow from a bow, and deer-headed Siddhi Kari, greenish red and holding a vase. O oh, you, the six yogini from the west, who enact the rites of subjugation, perform the rites which assure our independence during the intermediate state. So this rites of subjugation. The subjugation, how is this accomplished? How is this done? One word that, that 
can be substituted for that subjugation can be a magnetizing. It's not like a net is being physically thrown over these beings and then they're being poured, you know, pulled in a particular direction or something, or that you're throwing your arms around them. It's more spiritual in that they're like being magnetized. They're being drawn in through this, this magnetizing power, this raza, this magnetizing power, raza, R-A-Z-A. You'll see that <clears throat> in several of the, the prayers and practices that we do, and it means this magnetizing quality of the, of the, of the deity. So this right of subjugation, this right of, of magnetizing, that we become the magnetizer perform the rites which assure our independence during the intermediate state. So what is this independence of? And I had to look this up to make sure that it, it, was, it was correct, that it wasn't interdependence. Because, you know, we talk so much about interdependence, but this is speaking about the independence from negativity, the independence from coercion, the independence from contamination, that we maintain a degree of integrity that we have developed, that we have cultivated, so that we're not drawn down by these negative, non, non virtuous, or these uh, confused uh, um, um, attitudes or way of thinking or points of view. We're not pulled down by those. We're maintaining our independence of spirituality. Of course, the spirituality speaks of the, inter, the interdependence of things, the interconnection of things. So the way in which we, we gain this independence, the way in which we do this is by bringing everything onto the path. So it's a, it's a matter of which point of view you're kind of looking at this. You know, so we have to be a little bit flexible. We can't allow ourselves to get so rigid. We have to be able to, to turn things and look at things from a different point of view and so on. It's an important lesson, you know, through being spiritual. So these are the four activities. The four activities are subjugation, enrichment, and pacification that we've talked about so far. So the East speaks of the pacification. The South speaks of the enrichment or increasing. And the West speaks of the subjugation. Okay. Then we go to the North, which would be on page 60. And now we say, Om Ah Hong. In the minor channels of the Northern outer courtyard of one skull stand the six Queens of yoga who enact the rites of wrath. This wrathfulness is challenging. Wolf-headed Veyu Devi, bluish green and brandishing an ensign. Ibex-headed Agni, reddish green and holding a firebrand. Sal-headed Barahi, blackish green and holding a noose of fangs. Crow-headed Kamuti, Kamundi, reddish green and holding an infant corpse. Elephant-headed Bujana, blackish green and holding a bloated corpse. And snake-headed Vayunavi, bluish green and holding a noose of snakes. O you, the six yogini from the north, who enact the rites of wrath, challenging. Perform the rites which utterly destroy the confused perceptions of the intermediate state. The confused perceptions <clears throat> of the intermediate state. We may take in with us conceptions, but those conceptions need to be purified and they need to be liberated, that we're not holding on to them, that we don't have aversion to them, and they don't become the the fosters of jealousy and greed and delusion and so on. So we want to be able to figuratively destroy them. We're destroying them by light. We're destroying them by experience. We're destroying them 
by bringing them together with, with the truth and being able to neutralize them. So if we're, we're looking at them, you know, in this, in this dualistic way, that there is, this, there is this falsity of these confusions, of these false perceptions, and so on, and that they are being, they are being matched up with the, the truth of those, and then they become neutralized, they become liberated. So in that way, they're being destroyed. So it's important to, to keep these distinctions because, you know, destroy has a connotation of, of a certain wrathfulness. You know, wrathfulness has a certain connotation of a, of a certain aggression and hatred, but it's great compassion on both sides. That the negativity, that the confusion is being neutralized by the wisdom. The non-virtue is being neutralized by the virtue until it becomes a non-thought. Isn't that one of our goals is to, is to release our thoughts, to liberate from our thoughts. And that doesn't mean that thoughts still don't happen, but the thoughts just, they, they, they don't land. They just move right through. So we do this, this, this um, destroying the confused perceptions through education, through achievement, through accomplishment, through transformation are key words that would be associated with this. So we have to, you know, we have to consciously, you know, met, uh, elevate you know, these, these action words into, a, into a, a, a compassionate point of view. Not one where we're, we're you know, we're, sub, we're, 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 you know we're, we're trying to bang these things into some kind of submission or something like that. No, we're doing it through bringing the light, through the purification, through the wisdom. So there's six of these uh, Ishvari, these yoginis, in each of these four quadrants. So there's 24 of them. Okay. So we can see, we can contemplate the meaning of each of these quadrants. And, and going back again, talking about the peaceful deities, talking about the wrathful deities, and with the mandalas that you've been given with the book that you have and so on to be able to start cross-referencing all this and building up this this uh this library in your mind and your your thoughts and so on to be able to to see how all this is interactive with each other and so on and this takes time you know you don't do this in, inside of a of a of a single reading or inside of a week, or inside of two weeks, or inside of a year, or inside of two years, it's a it's a lifetime of 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 uh, of, of of investigation, of of study, of of allowing this to rise up through practice. We can read these things, and that's one thing that we need to do. But then we need to practice these things, and what we're practicing is our transformation of becoming this wisdom of becoming these deities. So the information that we are gathering is what these composite parts of these beings are so that we can bring this all together. We become the embodiment of it. And then, we, and then it just becomes transcendent. We just let it go. If we try and hold on to it, it doesn't become transcendent. It pulls it down. Transcendent means being lifted up, rising above. And there's no limit. The space is where we're headed for, where we want to be. And we have to allow ourselves to go to the space, to be able to see that, the Dharmakaya, the Rigpa. So don't be in a hurry. Have patience. 
have a plan. Follow the follow the the uh, the practices. So now we come to the outer courtyard. So if we're looking at the there's an outer gatekeeper. So if we go back to the uh, um, excuse me one second, let me find this one. Um, Got my book here. Yeah, I keep these things handy. I'm always going, I, you know, I've got all these things around me. And when I'm going through meditation and contemplation, things will come up and I say, oh, I need the perfect resource. I need the library. I need to remind myself of something because I can't remember it all, you know. But so I, I have these things in a way that I can get to them really quick. So I know that, so down here, this, this little section down here, this is representative of that outer courtyard or rather, excuse me, of the outer gatekeeper. So there'd be an outer gatekeeper for each of the quadrants. So you can look at that and you can see the names and so on. And you can look at that chart and you can see the references, it's all there. So now we're in the eastern gate of the skull. So it says, Om, I'm on page 61. It says, Om Ah Hom. At the outer eastern gate of one skull is Vajra Mahakali, white cuckoo headed and holding an iron hook, an iron hook, the hook. And the outer southern gatekeeper of one skull is Vajra Mahachagala, yellow, goat-headed, and holding a noose, a noose, a lasso, a noose. And the outer western gate of one skull is Vajra Maha Kumbhadakarini, Kumbhadakarini, red, lion-headed, and holding an iron chain, an iron chain. Remember these mudras? Za, hong, bam, ho. And the outer and the outer northern gate of one skull is Vajra Lambodara, dark green, snake-headed, and holding a bell, a bell. So it's hooking, it's tying, binding up, it's locking up with the chain, and then it's rejoicing with the bell. Za, hong, bam, ho. So here are these four yoginis who are bringing us in and we need to be able to to lock ourselves to, to to hook on to them bind ourselves with them chain ourselves with them and and rejoice with them keeping joy in our lives oh you the four female gatekeepers queens of yoga who enact the emanational rites perform the rites which obstruct the doors leading to mundane rebirth of the intermediate state. So queens of yoga, what does yoga mean? Yoga means union. Yoga is the Sanskrit word for union. So yoginis are the female deities or the female beings that are in union spiritual union with the body, speech, and mind. Or the male yogis who are body, speech, and mind in union with their spiritual, they are on the path, clearly on the path. The queens of yoga who enact the emanational rites. What does emanational mean? Emanational means that they are manifest that the spirituality of the Dharmakaya and the Sambhogokaya has now emanated into a form, a desire form, a human form that we can see, hear, touch, and feel, and so on. An emanation, these emanational rites perform the rites which obstruct the doors leading to mundane rebirth or ordinary mundane ordinary rebirth that lead to ordinary rebirth so if we're 
coming from the top down that that you know that we want to be able to connect with with good families and so on or that we want to be able to obstruct we don't want to to be born again and that maybe we have the ability to remain as as a, a spiritual being in the ways that we talked about when we talked about you know uh, uh, in part three of the Bardo total and as we're approaching from the bottom up coming up that we want to be able to have those gates open up for us so that we can approach further up the mandala further inside the mandala so to avoid our attachment or our aversion to the ordinary state, to the mundane states. So then we come to page 62 is this prayer. To you, the 28 Ishvari, it's the 24 Ishvari, and then it's the four gatekeepers, 28. Queens of yoga, I bow down, make offerings, take refuge and pray. As soon as we, the deceased, die and begin to transmigrate, at that very moment, when the visions of the intermediate state of reality dawn, and we, the deceased, roam alone in cyclic existence, driven by deep-seated, confused perceptions, may the seven Ishvari of the East draw us forward, leading us on the path of radiant, multicolored light, which is the vibrance of sounds, lights, and rays. May the seven Ishvari of the South support us from behind. May the seven Ishvari from the West support us from the perimeter. And may the seven Ishvari of the North destroy and liberate our enemies. And thus encircled, may we be rescued from the fearsome passageway of the intermediate state and be escorted to the level of an utterly perfect Buddha. So each one of these groups here is being called upon again. Mm, Deep-seated confused perceptions. May the seven Ishvari of the East leading us on a path of multicolored light, the vibrance of sounds, lights, and rays sounds, lights, and rays, manifestations of energy. May the seven Ishvari of the South support us from behind, supporting us from behind. May the seven Ishvari from the West support us from the perimeter. May the seven Ishvari from the North destroy and liberate our enemies. Who are our enemies? Those demons within ourselves. That's the only thing that we can control. That's the only thing that we can overcome. And this encircled, and thus encircled, may we be rescued from the fearsome passageway of the intermediate state and be escorted to the level of an utterly perfect Buddha. So putting us on the pathway. This, this may not lead immediately to being a Buddha like that, but it's putting us on the pathway that there is this, there is this this journey that we have to take and we have to go through it's a, it's a progressive journey so this is putting us on that pathway to become a buddha so now we come to page 63 om ah hom at this time when we dwell within the intermediate state of living, this intermediate state of living, where we are now, the assembly of the 60 blood drinking deities is radiantly present within the celestial palace of the skull. All this is in our brain. All this is part of our intellect. All this is what manifests as our speech and our actions and so on. Within the celestial palace of the skull, at the crown center within one's brain embodied in the form of a cluster of five colored lights. Here are the five colored lights being referenced. 
So this is beyond language, beyond our English language or Tibetan language or Spanish language or whatever language that as human beings we communicate in. This is now in the language of lights. Yet, as soon as we, the deceased, die and begin to transmigrate, the assembly, this assembly of blood-drinking deities will emerge from the brain and appear before us, filling the entire tricheliocosm. We talked about this last time. The tricheliocosm is this thousands and thousands and thousands of, 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 of systems galaxies, universes, however you wish to express it. Mm. That they emerge from the brain, appear before us, filling this entire tricheolosum. So this is beyond any, any kind of boundaries that we could ever imagine as an ordinary human being. Each of the, each of the central and peripheral forms will be endowed with fearsome ornaments and attire. So each of the central and peripheral, so the central would be the, the Harukas and the wrathful deities in the very center, but then the peripheral ones would be these Ishvari, would be the Matara and, the, and so on like that. And it's going in, going into the center, you know. Endowed with fearsome ornaments and attire. So we've talked about all this. Resounding within an immense space, Vibrant with sounds, lights, and rays, the bodily demeanor of these wrathful deities will be elegant, heroic, and yet terrifying. Their roar, their vibrant sounds, lights, and rays, the bodily demeanor of these wrathful deities will be elegant, heroic, and terrifying. Their roar, wild, murderous, and awesome, each blazing with compassion, wrath, and fierce aversion adorned by face markings of human ash, blood, and grease, dressed in skirts of moist hide and flayed tiger skin, decorated with skull garlands and wreaths of snakes, resplendent in a blazing mass of fire, which pounds with the cries of ha, ha, hom, pay, strike, slay. So we talked about this, that all those very wrathful attributes are, are symbolic of the great compassion, the fierce compassion to overcome the, 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 the negative forces that we have within ourselves, the demons that we have within ourselves, to be able to subdue them, to be able to purify them or to uh, pacify them, to enrich them, to, to subdue them, to challenge them to be able to be transformed, to be able to be neutralized. So not to be taken so literally as these uh, terrible deities, the way we approach this. This is the, the design of this is, to, is to, for us to be able to recognize that our human life, that this body and everything is just, you know, is just food for other beings, just like, we eat meat or we eat insects or we eat this and that and everything. And we, you know, but we do that without thinking about it. Of course, I know many of us are, are vegetarians and so on. But the plants could think and we have to boil the plants. Think if a plant could think, oh my God, my brothers and sisters are being boiled <laughs> and somebody's eating them. So then we go to page 64. Om, ah, hom, reverberating like a thousand peals of thunder, fully arrayed with hand, emblem, uh, hand emblems and multifarious faces, displaying the arts of transformations. They will pulverize and rock the infinite tricheliocosm. At that very moment, when the fierce sounds, lights, and rays dawn before us, in terrifying manifestation. O oh, you compassionate assembly of wrathful blood drinking deities, O oh, beings of compassion, do not withhold your compassion at this time. 
as we roam alone in cyclic existence, driven by deep-seated confused perceptions of habitual tendencies. May the assembly of wrathful blood-drinking deities draw us forward, leading us on a path of radiant multicolored light which is free of fear and terrifying perceptions. May the assembly of wrathful female deities, queens of the expanse, support us from behind. May the assembly of the Matara, Pasachi, and female gatekeepers support us from the perimeter. May the eight great projectoresses who propel beings to exalted rebirths propel us from our from our mundane states into higher rebirth. May the diverse animal-headed Ishvari eliminate all obstacles. May the four supreme female gatekeepers obstruct the entrance to mundane births. And thus encircled, may we be rescued from the fearsome passageway of the intermediate state and be escorted to the level of an utterly perfect Buddha. So what's being implied here is that every meditation is a death. And with every meditation death, there is a meditation rebirth. And that as we rise up from the cushion, we rise up as more spiritual, as more of a Buddha, as more of a Bodhisattva, as more of a yogi or a yogini than when we first sat down and then went through that transformation of a death and a rebirth. Om ah hum. When we roam alone, separated from our loved ones, and myriad images of emptiness arise, naturally manifesting. May the Buddhas quickly release the power of their compassion and may the fear of the awesome and terrifying intermediate state be annulled. When the radiant multicolored light path of pristine cognition dawns, may we recognize its nature without awe and without terror. And as the manifold forms of the peaceful and wrathful deities arise, may we be fearlessly confident and recognize the characteristics of the intermediate state. When we recognize suffering as the result of negative past actions, may our meditational deities utterly dispel all such misery. And as the natural sound of reality reverberates like a thousand peals of thunder, may all sounds be heard as the sacred resonance of the greater vehicle. This is all being done on the cushion. This is our daily practice. This is our meditation. When we are driven on by past actions without a refuge, may the great compassionate one, Mahakarunika, protect us. And as we experience suffering generated by habitual tendencies and past actions, may the meditational stabilities of inner radiance and bliss naturally arise. May the fields of the five elements not rise up as a hostile force, but may we see these as the Buddha fields of the five enlightened families. We have to experience this. We can read this every day, every moment of every day for the rest of our lives, and it won't mean anything to us until we experience it. By the blessing of the spiritual teachers of the oral lineage, by the compassion of the assembly of peaceful and wrathful deities, and by the force of the purity of my altruistic aspiration, may all the aspirational prayers here expressed be immediately realized. Om, ah, om, mani, padme, hong, shri. Behold the jewel in the lotus, my primal cause.
Om Mani Padme Hum, behold the jewel in the lotus, the primal cause of being the jewel in the lotus. And that is the conclusion of the daily practice. So what do you think of this? Is it something to read once and forget? Is it something to practice? This is something maybe to read and study, you know, periodically, but be able to, to bring together the teachings and the other practices that we do, the deity yoga practices, the meditations that we do, to bring it and then to, to refresh our memory with, with this practice on a regular basis to, to help us to be the embodiment of this, to maintain our, our motivation and our dedication that we're doing this for the benefit of the enlightenment of other beings. Debbie, what do you think? Well, I, I love the daily practice, although I confess I'm not doing the whole thing every day, uh, but I have been taking a, a piece of it and trying to work with it. Uh, and trying to do that at least three or four times a week. Um, I found, for example, when we were doing Flight of the Garuda that I realized from the, some of the beautiful verses or songs in there, uh, I think it was like seven and 22, where they had these incredible descriptions of the five wisdoms that I'd really not been getting that. You know, I still had very much a arm's length uh, kind of intellectual understanding. So that took me right back in this daily practice to kind of the beginning, the peaceful deities, uh, and really trying to say, okay, what, what do these five wisdoms mean? If I really take them on board, how do I see myself differently than I now see myself? What, what opens up? What do they translate into? Uh, in kind of real simple language. And I did this guided visualization. Uh, and so the Buddhists would tell me, well, you know, this wisdom says you are timeless. This wisdom says you are limitless. This wisdom says you are boundless. And just kind of going through and really getting that in, even though it was just a little bit a part of the practice, uh, I felt like I came out of that with it not just being words uh, and still a lot more to work with there and, and have unfold. But what I, what I like about the practice is it actually can be two ways. It's not just them there like on a movie screen, but they're, they're really interacting or can interact with us because of course they are us. So I don't know if that makes any sense, but I it just I feel like with all of this and just the whole Bardo Turdo and also the daily practice that for me, the the real challenge is getting beyond words on a page to, OK, if this is coming from me, how does that really manifest you know, on on the cushion as well as off? Sure. And so who would believe this? Who would believe this? You said, you know, does this make any sense? You know, it, it sounds yeah. craziness to someone who is not yeah. you know, a spiritual <laughs> being, who's not familiar with this. This yeah. is craziness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Louisa, what do yeah. you think? Yeah, I think what has struck a chord with me here is the uh, on page 66, when we recognize suffering as a result of negative past actions, may our meditational deities utterly dispel all such misery. And I've been reading and studying a lot of uh, 
on healing. And some of the studies that have been made and shown is that our past actions, whether in this life or in past lives, uh, and also our negativity and negative thoughts, negative attitudes, all this can cause illness in our body. And so it, it's, it's, it's just mind blowing thinking that you have to work at putting away all those, you know, trying to st stop yourself from having any, any negative thoughts or actions like that, because the longer you have them and you continue with them, you, you can make yourself pretty sick and cause yourself some illnesses that you have no idea where they even came from. And that to me is, is such an eye-opening thought that it just makes me want to be more cognizant of what thoughts you have what actions you have, so you don't place yourself in the place where you can make yourself really, cause yourself illnesses and sickness that you have no idea where they came from, all because of your attitude, your thoughts, and just making changes in that and really meditating and working on trying, you know, getting your like these deities and helpers and guides to help you transform that and move away from that that's what i'm thinking so you see all this wisdom within yourself and not external to yourself yes yes because reading i mean just looking at all these uh publications and medical journals that their uh, science is now finding out that so many of these causes of our illnesses are brought on by ourselves by our internal thoughts mindset and all that in in negative ways very good thank you gary i see you rattling your head you you have a comment you'd like to make uh, how is this how is this study that we've done for what 10 months now or something like this how has this uh what transformation have you gone through well i don't know that uh, uh, i don't know that uh, it's quite reached a state of transformation but there is a sense of realization that uh, um Every time I have a sense of righteous indignation, I've developed very good in my life. Uh, the pain that I feel comes from within myself. And the question I ask myself is that whatever it is that I'm confronted with that I think is, uh, for instance, to use the word unjust, um, what do I do about it? do i do first something about myself and that's what this is this has told me um that first i have to govern uh, what comes from within me what energy that uh the things that are occurring externally which always will in the world uh is uh, is is arousing in me and why is it arousing that energy I have to deal first with myself. And if everyone was doing that, some of the things that would, were happening in the world probably wouldn't be happening. Um, I don't know if that makes much sense to you or the others, but I, what a lot of this has taught me is what's most important with regard to me personally is not what is happening there or but my what i what it is what it is causing within 
I have to go within. Everything comes from within to me. And if I'm going to find, uh, if I'm going to find enlightenment and going to find peace, I've got to look within. I can't say that this is happening to me. Things to be sure are happening that are not good. But if I'm to have any effect on any of it, the energy that comes from me has to be from the enlightenment that I am able to discover with it. And that is not the sort of thing like um, performing an act. It is a, a type of uh, inner transformation and in energy that I think has a, a, an almost indefinable effect on everyone around you. That probably doesn't make much sense to you, but it's it's something that I'm understanding about myself. Oh, it's just another one of those craziness things, huh? Well, <laughs> so, so tell me, so tell me, in the beginning, when we first started, did you think that you would be having these kinds of thoughts now? That 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 you would recognize this kind of transformation in your life? No. Did you think this is what it was, the, the Tibetan Book of the Dead? Well, I think we agree that the, the, the that's an unfortunate translation <laughs> for a title. And I've just started reading the Tibetan Book of the Dead, which I've had for some time. Um, so I don't know if I'm far enough along to give you an answer that would be meaningful. Okay. But uh, as I've told you many times, all my life, you know, is, is uh, you know, the, the it's been to see something, do something in terms of justice, or, or in terms of, of, you know, the oxymoronic phrase "fighting for peace," for instance, uh, is one that I've uh, grown up with. And what you end up when you fight for peace is you end up just in a fight. <laughs> okay very okay. good let me let me move on and ask somebody else uh does anybody like to speak up or should i uh ask somebody to speak somebody have a comment what has this meant to you john uh, michael turned on his microphone so uh michael go ahead um so this uh you know, reading through this has, uh, it's sort of like getting to know the, the, the uh, interior of my spiritual self. Um, it's, it's like having a map, it's like a Gray's Anatomy, you know, of, of, uh, <laughs> yeah exactly like a Gray's anatomy the bits and, and pieces you see all these wrathful deities with all the body parts right uh, yeah really <laughs> it's, it's definitely uh, yeah i mean it just goes to show you know you draw a picture of a body and something's going to tear it up um but but yeah i mean um really this is this is just this is just a a, a detailed wiring diagram for for the way I tick. I mean, none of us are gonna see this exactly the same and we're all gonna have the same, make the, have the same meaning making as we're reading through because it's not, it's more prosaic than technical. Um, but that meaning making is a part of our, our wiring and our rewiring. God knows I need all the rewiring I can get. So <clears throat> it's been a, it's been a, it's been a pleasure and a challenge, and um, it's definitely been a, a been a worthwhile read, and it's been a great introduction to um, to these volumes, to this whole uh, sort of canon of of work that is the Bardo. I mean, I've got a couple of pieces on my bookcase that I haven't touched uh, um, because uh, I mean, I have uh, Lincoln in the Bardo. You know, there's a book about Abraham Lincoln and uh, how he 
he went into the Bardo to find his dead son. So I I have some stuff that I love to read because my my interest has been sparked and I see this as a lifelong um, uh, perusal, a lifelong getting to know it. You know, it's like reading the Hardy Boys, one after another, and then there's always going to be a new one. Well, oh, that's the way it used to be. So there'll always be a new level for me. Uh, it's nice to know. It's 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 become comfortable, and the um, you know the the practice is is something that feels like slipping into a zone. Um, and, and I enjoy that. I enjoy that a lot. And the puzzle that's in that's underneath it all. It's gonna be fun. Thank you. So John, I'd asked you, would you like to comment on uh, what this has meant to you? I think, um, like you mentioned to us at the beginning, it, and it's really become evident, it's a really tremendous foundation for uh, understanding other practices better, because uh, you just, I've been introduced to quite a few practices, and you just jump in to them, um, uh, you you know there's a lot of abbreviations in the practices even in some of the longer ones and um you if you don't have the background you are not fully appreciating what what is what they're getting at in a lot of cases and this uh this has helped that a lot you know kind of understanding the foundation for uh for uh, the myriad practices that are exist in uh, Tibetan Buddhism, deity practices in particular. I mean, yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Curtis, would you like to comment? Um, I feel very aware that I have a, a superficial awareness of the Bardo Todal, but far more than I had uh, after Kempo taught it. Kempo's teaching left me very confused. I didn't have any sense of the structure. Um, but this has made makes a lot more sense. Uh, and um, I, I see it as a map, like Michael said, uh, it's a symbol system. You know, I, I think I sense its richness this, with a similar sort of perspective that Jung does. It's full of symbols, full of, um, full of mystery. It's a mystery teaching. Um, and... Um, you know, I, I, it's, it's to be pondered and reflected on and studied more. Um, it reminds me a little bit of um, Dante's Divine Comedy, which is a real map of the human psyche. Um, you know, it, 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 it's a different sort of map, different ground maps, but it's, this is very much a map of a lot of territory. Um, a lot of the psyche. Um, I'm very glad I've, I feel, I felt humbled, uh, humbled and grateful all along to be studying it because it's to be studying this is to understand some, one of the important works of uh, humankind has of what human experience is. I second the humbled and grateful. Thank you. Do you see any clarity in how it is you are now?
Well, I got to say, you know, I never really had detailed instructions for what to do after I die. Now I do. Well, how about that's, that's a pretty big deal. Well, how about the as you are now? How did you get to where you are now? I mean, this just didn't uh, develop in this lifetime. I mean, this has been around time, and you know, with it's a more uh, it's it's no time. It's birthlessness, you know. You know, so do you see a a continuum? Do you see the Tantra in this? You know, what is the Tantra? What is the Sutra? What is the Tantra? Well, it, at times on, on the cushion, there's just this ancient feeling. I mean, on the one hand, it's timeless, but on the other hand, there's such a depth to that timelessness that it really feels like something I'm in this stream moving along. And I've been in the stream for a long time and I'm probably still gonna be in the stream for a long time, but still that, that sense of there, there's a process here. There's you know some, how to navigate the stream maybe a little bit better. Yeah, yeah, I think I do. And, and, and that's you know, what I'm so grateful for in all of this you know, you know, to everyone here, but of course, especially to you, Lance, because uh, you gave us the tools that, as Curtis was saying, it did make it a lot clearer, your different handouts and mandala drawings and just your clear teachings. But also more than that, just the constant reminder, take it to the cushion, take it to the cushion. And then the other reminder that I think is so important because it's, it's just assumed in the Bardo Turdal, but it, it isn't spoken to specifically that much is this is all bodhicitta uh, and can't be understood outside of bodhicitta and bringing bodhicitta to the, the practice. And, and you kept reminding us of that because it's such a high level teaching and, and so assumed in here uh, that I know it would be, sometimes it was easy for me to forget and you would remind us and I'd go, oh yeah, oh yeah, that's what it's really about, bodhicitta. So thank you. You're welcome, thank you. William, you have any comment? And Bhavani, do you, do you, is, I presume Bhavani is there. I don't see her in the picture, but uh, I hope she's on the other end of the sofa there. Why? Oh, oh yeah. She's on the other end of the sofa, all right. Uh, I, I have, uh, I, I have a little bit of trouble with this last little bit that we're talking about here. Um, I, I'm not too sure how that uh, uh, how that all mixes in. What uh, last part are you talking about? The Ishvari? The yogi? Well, the, you know, you've got the drawings of the, uh, and, and you brought up the um, stupa, and I, it, it, it's, I'm, <laughs> I'm having trouble relating to the stupa to uh, and I I don't I don't quite get the stupa relationship to the to the drawing to the to the um, okay uh, what what is it the uh, not mantra. A courtyard. Yeah. Well, can I take a minute and just try and review that quickly? You know, the, the stupa is is the, the mandala. The stupa is is the, the the collective body of the Buddha. Of and and so all the meditational deities that we've been talking about are all, are on the stupa. You know, some place or another. 
But what we're talking about right now, what we've been talking about today and last week, is there's a courtyard around the stupa of, of spiritual but ordinary beings, or I should say ordinary beings but spiritual beings. And it's to that that the Ishvari are symbolic of. So they're, they're, So we might talk to somebody, we may overhear somebody speaking. Somebody might be in our, in our family or we might be at a dinner or we might be at a restaurant and overhear somebody say something and our mind just, it registers with us and all of a sudden there's a connection there. And so it's, it's that kind of a spiritual connection that the, the Asvari are talking about, that it's being transmitted through ordinary but spiritual beings. And to be able to recognize that, to be able to look at everyone as the potential of Buddha. That no one is void of Buddha. We all have Buddha. All beings have Buddha. And to be able to recognize that. So, so that's like the courtyard that is around the stupa, that is around there. So the Ishvari are representative of that. And what they're speaking to are the enlightened activities. The enlightened activity of pacification, of, of enrichment, of subjugation, and of, and of wrathful challenging. You know, and I don't know whether you've ever had the experience or anybody here has had the experience and whether you can speak to that, but maybe, you know, you're driving along or you're, you're thinking about something or you're, you're walking down the street or, or you're, 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 you're just sitting in the home and, and you're just thinking about something and you pick up a book or you turn on the television or the radio or you hear a piece of music or you're driving along and you see a, a street sign or something that speaks exactly to the problem that you're thinking about. You open up that book and that chapter, that page, my goodness, it goes right to what I was thinking about. Have you ever had that? You know, they might call it deja vu and stuff like that, you know? That's you synchronicity. Mean, that's synchronicity yeah. or something, that kind of magical thing that we might say you know, of the, that shows us that there is this connection. Well, this is the field of that connection. That's what the Ishvari are, are, are symbolic of. Well, it, it, it looks to me like we're talking about a different, uh, I don't know how to put this, uh, I'm here, um, but there's something that is uh, like a connection here, um, and that connective field is like what we're talking about with this. So in Buddhism, what do we call that? We have a name for that. <laughs> do. What? We do? Yeah. What is, what is that? Tantra. Tantra is, is that practice of familiarizing ourselves with that stream with that vibration with that that connection field that you're speaking about and the bardo total much of what we talk about is highest yoga tantra so maybe looking at it from that perspective it's not sutra it's not saying you got to do this these are the five of these and six of those and four of those and five of those. This is now how to become the embodiment of that, how to enter that stream. Like Debbie was saying, 
you know, that there's this stream, this, this water, this river or whatever, and now we have to navigate that. Do we swim against it? Do we, do we try and intersect with it? Do we catch a log? And we, we hold on to take us through the rapids or something like that. And is the log not our practice or our teachers to help us to navigate through that until we learn how to navigate it completely on our own, naked as we are? So to look at it from that point of view, that it, it's the Tantra that is, the, is that continuum the continuum, oh. that vibration. Okay, so I can see, I can see the stupa. And I can see it just like I, I can see me. Um, what we're working with here, I, you can't see unless you get into a, um, unless you get into a, 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 a different um, state of mind, state of mind, right. Where um, you have visions and if, if you have a vision, if you're in a state of mind where you have, where you're visionary, then you can see all of this, but you can't see it just like we're standing right here. Uh, it's it's not it's not there. It's I mean it's there, but it's it's not something that's visible to you. So that's, that's what we're trying to apprehend. That's the that's the part that I'm trying that I'm having trouble with is the. Do you have faith? Do you have faith that it's there? Mm -hmm. Do you have faith? I, well, I know it's there. Okay. I don't have faith. No, I don't have faith. You don't have faith because you know it's there. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I know it's there. Okay. So <laughs> I know this and I know this. And when so are you knowing it here or are you knowing it here? I'm knowing it here. Okay. Well then you're where you you're there then. But I'm I'm knowing I know it here, but I don't know it up here. You don't have to. That's the <laughs> that's the issue. That's what we need to leave behind. We don't need oh. that suit of clothes anymore. We don't need all the illusions. We don't need all the confusions that, that this brings with it. We need this. This is where it's at. Yeah. And it may not make sense to anybody else. And it doesn't need to. That's you know? true. That's true. So let me ask Bhavani. Is she, is she there? Is, is, does she want to comment? What's that? Um, uh. I'm, I'm nodding in and out, Lance. I'm really sorry. That's okay. Uh, no, that's okay. But, we'll catch up with you uh, another time, unless, unless you have something uh, you want to say right now. Yeah, I will say that I'm, I'm really grateful to be exposed to all of this. It's a lot of it is quite overwhelming and um, more than my mind can take in but I'm trying to go other than my mind and taking it in. How and about to, your heart? How about your heart mind? Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to visualize it and feeling it, um, but I don't have words to express it right now. Well, that's what this does is help us to, help, to give words to it, to express it, mm -hmm. you know? And I think sometimes words can be a, a problem like William you were talking about you know not being able to see in the same way that you see externally and 
what I find when you turn the mind within, it's really not about seeing even with you know, the mind's eye or the third eye or wisdom eye or whatever. It's more like remembrance. It's that feeling that engages the heart and there'll just be a little flicker of something that is like a connection, a remembrance and you go with that and it flowers into something and leads to, you know, just like when you're remembering something from your childhood, you remember that and then you remember something else and something else and it just has kind of a knock on effect to it. Uh, so that's just me, but that's what I've noticed that if I think, okay, you know, this is all about visualizing the peaceful and wrathful deities and, and all of their attributes and all of their colors and what the symbols are and what those symbols mean. I can get totally lost in that and turn it into exactly the wrong type of mental activity that I'm trying to get away from to begin with. But if I just kind of relax into remembrance and go from there, sometimes that's a very different kind of visualization, quote unquote, if that makes any sense. Hey, we're all a little crazy here, huh? <laughs> uh, I, wanna, I wanna give Tom an opportunity to say something, uh, Tom. Uh, the Grateful Dead have an album called, What a Long Strange Trip It's Been. <laughs> and lands Lance was the bus driver we we're all on that bus and he took us through this great great road trip showed us all these beautiful wonderful things now it's up to us to really practice these things and um it was, it was really heart opening to have Lance take all this time and effort to do all this teachings, to be completely selfless. That's what a bodhisattva does. An individual, an enlightened being that's completely selfless. That's what he is. And um, my heart mind uh, is really opened and it's, it's full of, it's full of uh, words can't even describe it. It's happiness beyond words. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for saying that. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Louisa. I think what you also said, Lance, about ex it's the experience. And that experience, for me anyway, comes from the heart. It's when I meditate and what I feel at that time in my heart and how it it just touches me in a way that is so amazing and it, it's it's different from anything that you've ever felt but you feel it in your heart and when you said that it's an experience you're so right that's what it is and every person has their own individual experience with that heartfelt amazing feeling when you reach that point it's it's just amazing thank you lance well you're welcome thank you very much it's uh there's nothing i can say but thank you i'm glad that we're all on this bus together thank you and and i think that no matter what you know we're We'll always remember this, you know, together, you know, and, and we're part, we're part, we're Sangha. This is Sangha. 
you know, and it's a spiritual word and it's a spiritual family and spiritual community. And, and we'll look at things differently than we ever thought we could look at them because of this experience that we've had studying this together. But as we move forward and, and windows begin to open, doors begin to open, experiences begin to be experienced and so on, you know, um, you know, we, we have some cases 20 years, maybe 30 years, 40 years of life left in our bodies. And what are we going to do with that? What kind of experiences are we going to have? You know, and so maybe this becomes, you know, the, uh, the map for those experiences. You know, however long we have, you know, do we shut down at some point? Why? What do we have better to do than, than this? If we've opened up this door, we've opened up this window, what is better than this? Why should we close it? And these are priceless teachings. These are priceless experiences that, that only transcendent human beings can have. So it's magnificent. You know, the, the trite words that we use, oh, it's wonderful, oh, it's terrific, oh, it's magnificent. What's the greatest word you can think of to try and explain something like this? It's like a mountain. It's like Mount Everest itself. You know, so when Tom was talking, you know, it made me think we've been through, we've been through Death Valley, the lowest part of, of the planet, and, and we've been to Mount Everest. And then we've taken off from there and, and we've been all around the atmosphere and out beyond the atmosphere. We've been out into space. You know, so we've got the, we've got the, the way to be able to do that. So in the very beginning, we said, we made the analogy that, that you know, Buddhism is like a 2000 piece jigsaw puzzle without a picture and we have to put it together for our Western mind you know and we need a table on which to put that puzzle together on and this has been the table Bruce, I, you want to say something to me yes you yes um uh along the lines of gratitude um underline again our gratitude to you um lance for teaching us um, the thing that is part of delusory existence is the way we take for granted our good karma. Um, it's really extraordinary that we're here in Zoom getting teachings on the Bardo um, with other sensitive, kind persons um, that we are all inclined to do something like this on a Friday night. Um, those are, those are things that aren't, you know, just by chance. And we're very, very fortunate. We're getting, we're getting, you know, the understanding we've gotten through your guidance slants is something that will, will be with us all our lives. Uh, it, it frames the human experience, a part of the human experience and in many ways, all of it, um, and that's those those sorts of understandings, those grasp of wisdom, are part of grasping the Dharma. We need to practice it too. But but to just get this this view um, through study is incredibly fortunate. And it didn't it it took a lot of things coming together, not just a good teacher, but our own willingness and interest and et cetera, et cetera. It's really quite. It's it's extremely magnificent. Now, yeah, everybody's ripe for this. Our karma is ripe for this. And that's magnificent all by itself, you know, to realize that. So, yeah, so thank you each and every one. I, I really appreciate the time that we've had together and and uh, if we want to continue things on Friday nights, we can do that. You want to take a break, we can do that. You know, we can, uh, there's many things that are 
associated with this, of course, that we can talk about that will help to um, uh, to refresh us with this. Uh, so uh, we want to communicate uh, through email, whatever. I'll, I'll send out a message and let everybody know if you want to make a comment about it. Uh, you know, just be frank and honest what you'd like to do. And if you want to take a break, that's fine. If you have something that you'd like to explore, say what that is and and I can make a suggestion or two and we can we can go with that. But uh, for myself, um, Friday night is a night to talk about these things. I've enjoyed it tremendously and and uh, and I'll continue it, you know, even if it's uh, as Garchin Rinpoche has said before, if it's just me and the dust mites, I'll teach the dust mites. So thank you. Uh, Debbie, can we do the uh, dedication prayers, please? My microphone is muted. Debbie, your microphone is muted. As we do this, coming to this wonderful round of teachings ends for now, let's take a minute, establish our motivation of bodhicitta and bring to mind all of the beings who we wish this practice that we've been doing together would benefit. Emma Ho, in the center is the marvelous Buddha Amitabha of boundless light. On the right side is Avalokiteshvara, the Lord of great compassion. On the left is Vajrapani, the Lord of powerful means. All are surrounded by limitless Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. Immeasurable peace and happiness is the blissful pure land of Dewachen. When I and all beings pass from samsara, may we be born in Dewa Chen without taking samsaric rebirth. May I have the blessing of meeting Amitabha face to face. By the power and blessings of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas of the Ten Directions, may I attain this aspiration without hindrance. Tayata Pensadriya Awa Bodhanaya Soha. Tayata pensadriya awa bodhanaya soha. Tayata pensadriya awa bodhanaya soha. This is it. The Buddhas and Bodhisattvas of the five families and three times who destroy defilement lead to the equipoise of the enlightened mind. Bodhicitta, the excellent and precious mind, where it is unborn, may it arise. Where it is born, may it not decline, but ever increase higher and higher. By this virtue, may I achieve all knowingness by defeating all enemies' confusion. May all who travel on the waves of birth, old age, sickness, and death cross the ocean of suffering. As Manjushri the warrior realized the ultimate state, and as did Samantabhadra, I will follow in their path and fully dedicate all the merit for all sentient beings. So now we recite the Mani Mantra, the Liberation Mantra. And as we do, we recite this with joy. Whenever there is suffering, we recite this with joy. Whenever there is happiness, we recite this with joy. Whenever there is sadness, we recite this with joy. This is the light. This is the mantra of liberation for all sentient beings that we can see, that we can't see, that are here among us, that are departed. This is the tantra. This is aligning, harmonizing with that continuum. 
Behold the jewel in the lotus. Omani Padme Hom Shri. Omani Padme Hom Shri. Omani Padme Hom Shri. Om Mani Padme Hong 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 Shri 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 Ao Mani Padme Hong Shri Ao Mani Padme Hong Shri Omani Padme Hong Shri Omani Padme Hong Shri Omani Padme Hong Shri Om Mani Padme Hom Shri Om Mani Padme Hom Shri Om Mani Padme Shri Padme Shri Padme Shri Omani Padme Hong Shri Omani Padme Hong Shri Omani Padme Hong Shri Omani Padme Hong Om Mani Padme Hum. 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 Om Mani Padme Hong Om Mani Padme Hong Om Mani Padme Hong Om Mani Padme Hong Shri Thank you all
Namaste. 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 Thank you ever so much, Lance. You're welcome. Thank you. I hope Thanks to see you all again soon. Thank you, Lance. Thank you, Lance. You're welcome, Louisa. Thank you. Thank you. Thomas, Thomas. feel better. Okay. Yes. Hey, thank, thank you goodness, so much. Oh, thank goodness Thomas is with us tonight. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't miss it for the world. It's really nice you're here with us, Thomas. <laughs> thank I've been worried thank about you. you. Guys. You guys are nice. Yeah. Thank you. Good night. Good night, thank you. Good night, all. Good night, all. Good night. Good night.